The last chapter we're going to discuss in this course is chapter 27. In this lecture, we're going to cover the nervous system and the sensory systems part of that chapter. In animals, the nervous system is basically the communication and coordination network throughout an animal's body. It is how an animal takes in information, processes it, and then responds to that information. Nervous systems are made up of what are called neurons, which are nerve cells that carry electrical signals from one part of the body to another. There's two main anatomical divisions of a nervous system. There's the central nervous system, or the CNS, and that's the brain and spinal cord. That's where all the integration happens. And then there's the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, and um, it is made of nerves that carry signals to, into, and out from the central nervous system. So that's basically um, the messengers is the peripheral nervous system. Now remember the nerve is the communication line made um, you know, between body parts and it's made from cable-like bundles of nerve fibers that are surrounded by connective tissue. Like I had alluded to before, there's three main functions of the nervous system. We have sensory input in which the animal is going to detect something in the environment. Okay, and sensory input is performed by what we call sensory neurons. Then we have the integration or interpretation of those sensory signals. Uh, that happens in the brain um, uh, and or the spinal cord, actually. And these are performed by interneurons. And then we've got motor output, which is basically leading to how the animal is going to respond to that um, detection in the environment. And these are performed by motor neurons. So let's take a closer look at neurons themselves. Motor neurons, um, we're going to focus on motor neurons. Motor neurons have three parts. They have a cell body that houses the nucleus and um, the organelles. Okay, so in our picture here, the cell body is this part. Okay. Then we've got dendrites, which are very short and highly branched little projections that are on the cell body, all around the cell body. That's these guys around here. Okay, those are the dendrites. Um, their responsibility or their function is to receive messages from other neurons. Okay, so they're the receivers. And then last but not least, we have the axon. Okay, which is a single long fiber that projects from the cell body. And that's going to transmit signals to other neurons. Okay, so we've got the, um, the input through the dendrites. Okay, and then um, that signal is going to go through the cell body and down the axon out to another cell. Neurons also have supporting cells around them to protect, insulate, and reinforce you know, these neurons. Um, axons are enclosed with an insulating material called a myelin sheath. And this is very important because it actually speeds up the electrical transmission. It's like um, insulation in a sense. Um, so it's going to speed up the electrical transmission down an axon. Um, and the axon you know, transmission is 150 meters per second. So that's 150 meter sticks long. So the, the electrical signal travels down 150 meter, 150 meter sticks long in one second. So it's super fast. Um, now if the myelin sheet is compromised, like in the disease multiple sclerosis or MS, um, basically that's the destruction of myelin sheaths by the immune system. We don't get as good signals, and so um, they start to, you know, get symptoms of, um, you know, weakness and not being able to think or move or or um, respond as quickly because uh, the the speed of their electrical transmissions in their neurons um, are greatly reduced because of that destruction of the myelin sheath. All right, so let's take a look at how neurons send a signal. 
So a neuron at rest has what's called potential energy. Okay, so inside of the cell, it is negatively charged. Outside of the cell is positively charged. Okay, so if we take a look at this picture here inside of the cell, overall we're going to have a negative charge relative to the outside of the cell that's going to be positively charged. This difference in charge across the plasma membrane is called the resting potential. Okay, it's because that's the electrical potential across the membrane when a neuron is not sending a signal. All right, so in order for a neuron to send a signal, a stimulus has to trigger it. Um, so a stimulus has to trigger a neuron to release its potential energy. And a stimulus is any factor that causes a nerve cell to be generated um, and cause what's called an action potential. So basically it's any input that a nerve signal gets is a stimulus. And so if a nerve signal receives a stimulus or an input from... Um, either receptors or from other neurons, it's going to release that potential energy and we get what's called an action potential. When neurons send a signal, it's called generating an action potential. And there's four basic steps to generating an action potential. First, we talked about is that when a membrane is at rest, remember it's negatively charged on the inside and positively charged on the outside. So when a stimulus, something touches it, in, in essence, um, triggers the neuron, uh, that stimulus is going to trigger channels to open up and let positive charges inside the cell. Okay, So remember, um, in a neuron, we have positives outside and negative inside. And so when... A, uh, stimulus triggers it, the positives are going to rush inside. They're going to be, um, you know, attracted to those, the, the negative charge, um, on the, on the inside. Okay. So th there's a high bunch of, um, positives on the outside. And so kind of diffusion says we go from high concentration to low concentration. So they rush towards the inside of the cell. Now, if a threshold of channels is open, that means if enough channels are opened, um, by this stimulus, then it will, it will basically um, do what's called a chain reaction and um, more channels will open to let more positives in. And so all these positive charges, okay, are going to initially, you know, cl clo I'm sorry, not, or all the positive charges are going to close those initial channels and open other channels um, to let positive charges back out again. So we get this cycling of positive charges in, positive charges out. Um, and that's um, basically what we call an action potential. And these um, channels opening up and closing again are going to run the length of the axon. Okay, so we can see in the picture um, here that uh, A is the resting potential. Okay, when a stimulus is received, look, these channels right here are opening and letting um, positives in. Okay, negatives go out, and we get more channels along the cell, okay, opening up. And so the next picture would probably be of the channels over here opening up. So we get this kind of spread down the axon of these channels opening up, letting positive charges in, um, and... You know, as soon as a bunch of positive charges goes in, those channels close and the next ones down the line open up. And so that spreading of that action potential down the axon is what we call propagation of an action potential. Um, so it's the opening of channels at one end of the axon that triggers the opening of more channels further down and further down and further down the axon um, as, it's, as it goes you know, um, down. So we start, we'll start here and then... Um, the channels will start to, to open all the way down the axon. This action potential is going to travel all the way down the axon until it reaches the axon terminal, basically the end of the axon. And then the signal has to be passed between that neuron and the next. Um, that's what's called the synaptic 
naptic cleft. So the naptic cleft is the space in between one neuron here, okay, and then, that, and then the second neuron there. Okay, so the receiving cell, that means the second neuron, can either be another neuron or it could be a muscle cell or an endocrine cell that's going to uh, perform a task. Okay, so we've got um, two types of synapses that, that can happen or two types of messages that can be um, propagated through a synaptic cleft. Either an electrical synapse is where electric current is passed between cells and this actually only happens in two parts of the body, the heart and the digestive tract. Um, most other um, neur neuron signals are chemical. Okay, So no most other synaptic clefts are going to propagate the messages through chemical means, which means we have to have neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters okay, are chemicals that um, pass between cells. So these um, little dots within here, okay, those represent the neurotransmitters. So um, it is a little chemical that's released by the sending neuron, the first neuron, and um, it's going to, the second neuron is then going to receive um, that message and bind to the neurotransmitters in order to keep that message going on. And uh, chemical synapses are found in all other organs and muscles. So when we take a further look at the communication at a synaptic cleft, there is actually six basic steps. So the first step is we get an action potential that arrives at the axon terminal. Bam. Action potential arrives. This causes the little vesicles with neurotransmitter inside of them. That's these pink things here. These are vesicles with neurotransmitters inside of them to fuse to the plasma membrane on that sending neuron. Okay. Um, next, then those vesicles will release the neurotransmitter out into that space, which is called the synaptic, synaptic cleft. So the neurotransmitters that are released from the vesicles are going to diffuse across that synaptic cleft and they're going to bind with receptors okay, that are on the plasma membrane of the receiving cell. Remember, the receiving cell is going to receive these messages on the dendrites of the neuron, um, if it's another neuron. Otherwise, it'll be um, just receptors on muscle cells or endocrine cells. Okay, Once the um, neurotransmitter is bound, that is going to open ion channels in the receiving cell and trigger an action potential or a response from that cell as well. So after those uh, neurotransmitters get to the plasma membrane, then, okay, like we saw before, it's going to open ion channels in this cell and that signal is going to be propagated down that cell as well. Um, now lastly, we don't want these neurotransmitters to kind of stay there in the synaptic cleft, otherwise that second um, cell is going to be activated over and over and over again, Okay, um, which is probably not the, the original idea of the message. So the neurotransmitters have to be broken down to prevent further signaling. So we've got enzymes in there that are going to break down the neurotransmitters um, in order to kind of clear them away so that when the next signal comes, um, either the same or different neurotransmitters can be released to send different signal. Okay, so let's talk about those neurotransmitters. There's uh, different kinds of small molecules that can act like neurotransmitters. Amines are one of those kinds. Amines are going to be derived from amino acids. So we're going to see the same type of characteristics, um, nitrogen-based kind of things with um, amines that we see in amino acid structure. Some examples of these amine type neurotransmitters are serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And we've got, and we can see the um, structures on the right here. So this is serotonin. Okay, here we have dopamine, and the last one is norepinephrine. And we see that the thing that they, all of them share is 
the amine group, which um, if you remember from chemistry, is just anything with a nitrogen in it. So they're all going to share at least having a nitrogen somewhere within their chemical structure. So serotonin and dopamine, okay, these two, are going to affect your sleep, your mood, your tension, and your learning. So a lack of serotonin can cause depression. Lack of dopamine can cause um, Parkinson's disease. Okay, too much dopamine can actually cause schizophrenia. So there's a a nice balance that has to happen with the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. Otherwise, you get you know um, diseases and uh, other kind of side effects. Um, another type of molecule that can act as a neurotransmitter is what's called a peptide, which is basically just a short chain of amino acids, so a very short kind of protein, um, can also send signals and be used as neurotransmitters. An example here are endorphins. You probably have um, heard of the release of endorphins when you're exercising uh, because they decrease the perception of pain. Um, so... A lot of times uh, your body is going to, when you're exercising, release endorphins so that uh, you keep exercising and you don't um, you know, feel as much pain when you exercise. Now, when you're not exercising and then all the soreness you know, comes in, then, uh, then you wish you had the endorphins going on again. Endorphins can also act um, as hormones, so ce you know, cell signals that are not necessarily between neurons but um, other cells as well. All right, so drugs, whether they're illegal or pres prescription drugs, affect the actions of these neurotransmitters at the synaptic clefts. So, for example, caffeine is a drug that's a stimulant, and it counters the effects of any inhibitory transmitters. So an inhibitory transmitter is one that's going to stop a signal down a particular route of neurons, and caffeine says, ah, I don't think so that signal is still going to go through. So that's why it's stimulant um, in that sense. Alcohol is a depressant. So it's going to stop signals in your brain. Um, and, you know, basically that's kind of one reason why you kind of stop thinking and get stupid when you're on alcohol. Um, <clears throat> because it increases the effect of those inhibitory transmitters. So signals for, um, you know, to for smart decisions and stuff like that, um, are inhibited and therefore you get actions that are, um, not so, so good. Tranquilizers like Valium and Xanax are, um, going to be depressants as well, just like alcohol and, um, activate receptors for inhibitory transmitters. Okay. So, um, so if it increases the receptors for inhibitory transmitters, that means um, the effects of inhibitory transmitters is going to be increased, and so we get this you know mellowing effect uh, because signals are stopped in the brain um, that you you know would cause agitation and or um, you know kind of stimulus excitement. Schizophrenia drugs. Um, remember we said schizophrenia is caused by too much dopamine in the brain, so schizophrenia drugs block dopamine receptors so that the, um, the brain isn't overacted by, do over, um, reacts with dopamine. And Ritalin, which is a drug for ADHD, acts, um, is basically a drug that is going to, um, base, act like dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain. So ADHD then has, uh, a component where, uh, there's like not enough dopamine and norepinephrine, um, in the brain. So the drug Ritalin acts like it so that it kind of, you know, normalizes or stabilizes um, the brain signals. Last couple of drugs that we'll talk about are um, amphetamines and cocaine, which um, have their high effect by increasing the release of norepinephrine and dopamine. Um, so those are, de remember, definitely our mood kind of um, neurotransmitters that affect the mood um, and give you that sense of euphoria and that high. LSD, which is a lyser lysergic acid, uh, diethylamide, okay, is what LSD 
um, stands for. And other hallucinogenic type drugs have their effect uh, because they're going to activate and stimulate serotonin and dopamine receptors, uh, which remember serotonin and dopamine have a lot to do with sleep and um, images as well, okay, that the brain will kind of create as you sleep. And so if you're activating a bunch of um, serotonin and dopamine receptors, you may get those uh, dream images, those kind of hallucinogenic images um, while you're awake as well. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, marijuana is another drug that activates receptors for pain, depression, appetite, memory, and fertility. Um, opiates like morphine and codeine and heroin bind to endorphin receptors. So that, so these opiates are going to act like endorphins um, and reduce pain. So that's why morphine is given for pain. Uh, but it also increases that euphoria high feeling of um you know, that, that heroin addicts and stuff are, are so, you know, clinged on to. Uh, so that's kind of how the drugs are going to affect the brain. And you have to remember that um, this is all, this, you know, all of these drugs, um, your brain becomes, you know, kind of dependent and or, um, what's it called? Like, the more you use of it, the less the the brain is actually going to um, respond to it. So that means you need more and more of the drug to get the same effect. And so a lot of times um, that, you know, causes addiction and causes, um, you know, people spending more of their time and more of their money to get these drugs to get the same kind of high. Um, a lot of drug users are depressed because they have to use more to get the same high. And so it's, it's this, it's this crappy cycle of, of drugs. So don't do drugs. There's a uh, much better uses of your time and money <laughs> than on, uh, on, uh, fake kind of illusions of, uh, euphoria and, and, and highs, um, for your brain. All right. So let's talk about the human nervous system, um, in a little bit more detail. So the CNS member is made up of two parts, the spinal cord and the brain. The spinal cord have um, nerve fibers inside of it. It's the communication that runs between the brain and the rest of the body. So here, um, the spinal cord is housed inside of your spine, your vertebrae, um, and it is attached in this, you know, upper part to your brain. If the spinal cord, if you get in an accident or whatever and you crush your spine and the spinal cord becomes damaged, um, these cells cannot be repaired if injured. So that's why paraplegia and quadriplegia paralysis can happen. Um, it's usually because of an injury to a spinal nerve. The brain is also part of the central nervous system. That's the master control center. That's the one that's going to send and receive signals to and from your body. Uh, both the, the spinal cord and the brain are covered in meninges, which is basically just tough connective tissue. And um, inside of that connective tissue is cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. And um, that fluid is basically there to cushion um, the, the brain and spinal cord for further protection. And it also um, has nutrients in it that will you know, keep the cells alive as well. The peripheral nervous system has two parts, a voluntary part, okay, um, that is, you know, the motor system that carries signals to the skeletal muscles, so that's um, the voluntary part that basically you can control, okay, and then we have the autonomic part, which sounds like automatic, um, which means that you don't really control it, it's automatic, so the autonomic one is going to regulate the internal environment, because remember, you don't tell your lungs to, you know, to, or your ribs to expand for your lungs to suck in air. Um, you don't tell your liver to detoxify, you know, drugs and other, um, chemicals from your body, make bile and your stomach to churn, to digest. That would be a heck of a lot of things to remember to do in the course of the day in order just to function. So these things, um, that happen on the inside are, um, controlled, by the autonomic nervous system and are automatic. 
Um, so the autonomic nervous system, uh, like I said, is going to control the smooth and cardiac muscles of your body. It's involuntary, and there's basically two divisions of this autonomic nervous system. We have the parasympathetic division, which is um, co controlling you know, the rest and digest type part. So when your body's at rest and, and or after you know, eating, it's going to control you know, the muscle, the internal muscles for that kind of environment. Versus the sympathetic division, okay, that's going to control um, your organs when you're in this fight or flight kind of like hyper agitated, adrenaline rushing kind of stage. Um, so we've got those two different divisions of the autonomic peripheral nervous system there that controls the internal environment depending on what you are what you are doing, whether you're up and active and running around versus um, sitting, resting, and digesting. When we take a look at the structure of the brain itself, um, it basically kind of looks like this in the picture. Uh, we have what's called the brain stem, okay, um, or the, you know, kind of the middle part of the brain. This um, is going to, in general, control all the um, internal kind of stuff that goes on. Um, it's going to control the basic survival parts of, of life. Um, so like, you know, your heartbeat and your um, digestion, your, you know, scare responses and, and movement and stuff like that are going to be controlled by this, um, this brainstem type part of the brain. Uh, it's the one part of the brain that kind of all higher animals have in common. Um, when you get higher and higher up kind of the animal chain, um, it's the cerebral hemispheres, the cerebrum here, um, that's going to get larger and larger um, with, you know, kind of subsequent uh, level of animals. Okay, so we kind of all share the same structure here with the brainstem and the cerebrum is what um, makes, you know, humans humans kind of thing. Okay, so we see here um, another picture of the brain, and now um, it, along with the parts, the part names, it's going to tell you what they're responsible for. So if we start here um, with the cerebrum, okay, so the cerebrum is this big outside. Um, that is going to be for sensing, thinking, learning, emotion, voluntary movements, that kind of thing. Um, the amygdala which is this tiny little part right there, um, is part of what's called the limbic system. The limbic system is a um, responsible member for kind of the, the basic survival of our bodies. Um, and the limbic system, or the amygdala in there is involved in emotion and aggression. Uh, the cerebellum, which is uh, this here, is going to coordinate um, your fine muscle movements and balance, give you balance. Your spinal cord, okay, is a member responsible for transmitting information between the brain and the rest of the body, okay, and it also will, ha will handle simple reflexes. Um, so not all sensory inputs go to the brain. Some of it, if it's a reflex, um, will uh, happen within just the spinal cord itself. The medulla, okay, which is um, basically this part of the brain stem, the first part of the brain stem um, up from the, the spinal cord, is responsible for um, unconscious functions like breathing and circulation. Okay, um, The pons, which is the next kind of section up, is for sleep okay, and arousal. And then um, your pituitary gland, this little tiny little thing that looks like it's hanging off, um, is basically your, your master gland that regulates all the other endocrine glands um, that are going to send chemical signals to different parts of your body um, for uh, regulation, like you know adrenaline rushes and menstrual cycles and all those kind of things that, that hormones are for. Um, hippocampus is this kind of in between the 
the pons and the amygdala is your hippocampus involved in learning and memory. Um, your hypothalamus is this kind of part that's underneath your thalamus. Okay. Hypothalamus um, regulates hunger, thirst, temperature control, and the thalamus is going to handle um, incoming and outgoing signals. It's kind of like a relay system for the cortex. And then last but not least, you have this, um, this thing right here. It's called the corpus callosum, which is um, basically going to transfer information between the two sides of your brain because you have two cerebral hemispheres, a right and a left, okay? And so that corpus callosum is basically the connection between the two sides. All right, so that was kind of a look um, towards the inside of the brain at, uh, you know, basically the, the midbrain there, midbrain section, all its different parts. This is a picture of the cerebral cortex, um, and we're going to take a look at these, you know, what it, what each area it controls. So we have the the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex, um, which is basically kind of this whole section here, um, and that's for uh, you controlling basically some some of your behaviors and some of your moods. Um, the temporal lobe is the lobe that is nearest your ear. Okay, so the temporal lobe is here. Um, for some of the senses, like auditory, taste, and smell, um, can be found in the temporal lobe or just beneath it. The occipital lobe is towards the back of your head. Okay, there's a green part here, and that's for vision. Controls most of your vision. So if you get knocked in the back of the head or you fall down and you hit the back of your head, that's, you know, the seeing stars thing is because you've um, jostled your occipital lobe um, and it's, you know, the connections that gotta get right again. Um, the pari parietal lobe, and if you've had anatomy, these all go um, along with the bones that are there in your skull as well. So the parietal lobe, which is near the top of your head, um, the top kind of back of your head here, is, um, you know, basically for sensory association area. So sensory from your skin, your musculoskeletal system, um, any kind of sensory things is going to be integrated in the parietal lobe. And then last, um, <clears throat> but, you know, kind of, well, actually this whole, this whole thing is kind of your parietal lobe. Um, you've got also a part of your parietal lobe that is for um, motor, you know, area. So this, this over here does senses and then sends signal over here for motor in order for those signals to go back down to your, um, to the different body parts. So that's kind of how the uh, cerebral cortex is is laid out, organized, and um, what parts, what functions each part has. Okay, so the last part of this lecture, we're going to talk about um, the senses, okay? And we're going to talk in detail about the sense of vision. And in your textbook, it also talks about hearing as well. Um, <clears throat> but let's take a look at the senses. So Remember, sensory input is using receptors to sense the environment around you and sending that information to the CNS, okay, up the spinal cord into the brain. So sensory cells are going to detect one of these types of things, either chemicals in the environment, light in the environment, sound, cold, heat, or touch, okay? So the sensory um, receptor cells convert one of these types of signals Remember, these are all stimulus. Um, so this, a stimulus is, you know, any one of these things that the sensory cells detect. Um, so your sensory cells are going to convert one of those types of stimuli to an electrical signal. And this is what we call signal transduction. Okay, it's turning one type of signal into another. So we're going to take a look at how sensory transduction works, and um, the example we're going to use is from your tongue. Okay, so a taste bud in your tongue, this is how it gets its signal. So sugar, as soon as it's dissolved, um, is going to bind to membrane receptors in your taste bud. Okay, so here's, for example, this whole thing is a taste bud. Okay, 
this whole sensory receptor is what we call a taste bud, and we've got a sugar receptor right there. Okay, so the sugar is going to bind to the um, <clears throat> receptor, and the binding of that is going to cause what's called a tr signal transduction pathway. And lucky for you, you don't really need to know all of these steps. Okay, um, if you are a science major, especially a biochem major, this is basically all you study is different signal transduction pathways in which enzymes are um, activated and how they interact with each other and blah, blah, blah. All you need to know is that it's called a signal transduction pathway, uh, which basically causes, again, like we saw in the neuron, ion channels to open and close, changing the receptor potential. Okay, So the stronger the stimulus, the stronger the potential. So basically, um, what you need to know is that sugar binds. Once it's bound, the signal is sent through the cell. And that signal is called a signal transduction pathway. Um, and it's going to send that signal to the um, central nervous system. So receptor cells are going to be hooked up to sensory neurons in the end. So um, we're going to get you know ion channels moving and vesicles um, being docked at the membrane, little neurotransmitters uh, released in order to send that signal to a sensory neuron, which is going to go to the brain. So let's take a look at different types of sensory receptors that we have in our body. We've got pain receptors that are going to respond to excess heat or pressure, or even chemicals released by damaged tissue. Okay, so that's why if you get a really bad sunburn, um, it hurts. Okay, because um, that, you know, damage from the, um, or chemicals released from that damaged uh, skin tissue is going to activate pain receptors. So every part of your body has pain receptors except the brain. The brain itself does not have any pain receptors. That's why they um, can do, you know, open brain, you know, open skull surgery um, and have you still be awake. And in fact, they need you to be awake so that they know they're not nicking a part of the brain that's going to, you know, affect something major. Uh, but that's why, you know, they could totally be up there and you're not feeling a thing. Okay, or at least any pain at all. Uh, we've also got thermoreceptors that detect heat or cold. Okay, Mechano mechanoreceptors that detect touch and pressure, stretching, motion, and sound. Um, these guys are mechanoreceptors. And the way they work is that the, the, the pressure, stretching, and stuff like that is going to change the shape of the um, cell membrane, and that shape shifting is basically going to send a signal rather than actually, you know, having um, something bind to a receptor to activate trans signal transduction. Just the bending of the membrane in a certain way is going to send that signal transduction down um, to the sensory neuron. Two more types of sensory receptors, chemoreceptors. Okay, um, are attuned to chemicals in the environment. These are mostly in your nose and your taste buds. And electromagnetic receptors are sensitive to various um, forms of energy, um, different wavelengths of energy like light. And so um, an example of an electromagnetic receptor would be the photoreceptors that are in your eye. Which segue us into talking about the sense of vision and your eyeballs. So um, let's take a look at the structure of the eye. The structure of the eye is uh, pretty complex. Okay, we've got um, a the part of the eye called the sclera. Okay, which is um, the outer surface. It's really tough. It's kind of the whitish layer. Okay, of connective tissue. So the sclera is connective tissue, and it's going to be on the outer surface of the eyeball. It's tough. It's protective. Okay, that's called the sclera. The cornea is the part of the sclera that becomes transparent on the front of the eye. Okay, so the cornea and the sclera are kind of, you know, one in the same, except the cornea is transparent versus the sclera is um, white. All right, so underneath the cornea, we have the iris. Okay, that's the um, part that gives the eye color. Okay, so here's the the iris. 
And you've got um, the pupil, which is basically just the opening in the middle of your iris um, that is going to let light in. Now inside of the eyeball itself, okay, just behind um, the iris <clears throat> is the lens, okay, um, held in position by little ligaments, okay, that you see there, those little ligaments hold the lens in place, okay, and uh, muscles within the eye are going to um, pull on the lens or relax the lens in order to change the shape of it so that we can see and focus. The retina is kind of the back part of the eyeball, okay, back here, um, is the retina, and it contains those photoreceptor cells that we were talking about um, when we were talking about electromagnetic receptors. So these photoreceptor cells are um, part of the retina. And then where all of the, you know, the basically where the retina sends all of its signals down is the optic nerve that's in the back, so that co connects the retina to the brain. And the last part of our, um, of our uh, the structure of the eye is the fluid that's within the eye. Okay, so um, basically this whole part here between the lens and the retina, okay, is, is basically just fluid. Um, that part, that fluid's called vitreous humor. Okay, it fills the larger chamber behind the lens, and the aqueous humor, okay, is between the cornea and the lens um, in the front. Okay, so that's the different parts of the eyeball. Let's take a look at the function of the eye. So each part of the eyeball obviously has a function to it. The cornea is going to let light into the eye and um, start the focusing, okay? Um, muscles in the iris, remember the iris is the, the color part of the eye, so muscles within the iris regulate the size of the pupil to control the amount of light. If there's not much light in a room, your, um, your pupil is going to be very dilated or very big. If there's you step outside and there's a ton of sunlight, it's really bright, your um, pupil, the iris muscles are going to close the pupil and the pupils will be very tiny. Um, so, and then, you know, as the, the light goes past the cornea, um, it's going to go through the lens. The lens is your major focusing part of your eye. Um, it's going to focus the light onto the retina, those photoreceptor cells. And again, the lens has, um, it's, a, you know, attached with ligaments, which are attached to muscles. And those muscles can either contract to um, lengthen the lens or, or relax in order to, um, you know, kind of make the lens more round. And that's going to help us focus light onto the retina. So remember, the retina is where those photoreceptors are located. So we have two types of photoreceptors. We have rods and cones, and they're, sh they're um, named for their shape. So the rod, okay, is, is these ones that look like rods at the ends, okay? And the cones are these ones that look like more conical at the end. Um, rods are going to be very sensitive to um, light and, and dim light. So they can pick up you know, one photon of light um, your eyeball can sense. And so um, that would be the rods that are sensing um, very small dim light. Help us see in the dark. Those rods help us see in the dark. Uh, but they don't help us see any color. Okay, so that's why um, you don't really see any color in the dark. It's just shades of gray. Um, the photo inside of the this the rod photoreceptors are little pigments called rhodopsin. Um, they're little chemical pig, pigments that, when they're activated by light, um, they're going to send a signal, uh, you know, down to a sensory cell, um, down the optic nerve to your brain. Now the cones, on the other hand, are stimulated by really bright light. Okay, um, and they're the ones that help us see color. So we have red cones, green cones, and blue cones, okay, RGB, red, green, and blue, okay, and all the other colors are, are um, created, all the other shades and all the other colors are created by um, the, basically the culmination of uh, the different senses from all these different red, green, and blue um, 
cone stimulus. Okay. Now the pigment inside of cone receptors is called photopsin. Okay, so that's the the chemical that's going to then um, make that you know signal transduction down the cell and activate um, sensory neurons that go to the brain. So the um, the the retina kind of looks more like this picture here, where there's a bunch of rods and cones all kind of inter inter uh, woven there, um, and they all are going to send their their signals. Okay, down um, to sensory cells to the optic nerve, eventually to the brain. Remember the occipital part of the brain. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about um, when it comes to vision is vision problems. Um, so we're going to talk about three basic vision problems that um, are common to a lot of people. Nearsightedness or myopia is um, where you can't you can see near. Okay, so nearsightedness means you can see near, you can't see far. Okay, so um, if I take out my contacts, I cannot see far. So I'm definitely nearsighted. I have what's called myopia. Um, in myopia, the eyeball, okay, is kind of too long to get to focus, for the lens to focus, um, you know, the focal point on the retina. So this is nearsightedness where if you compare it to the normal eyeball, it looks a little longer in shape okay and that is going to mess up the focal point and um, is, is not going to it's going to get the focal point basically in front of the retina rather than on the retina and so then um, we get this blurred vision so when we're you know when you have glasses or contact lenses um, basically the lenses are going to be thinner in the middle than on the edges in order to help um, help uh, focus that light further back in the eye. So you'll have a very thin front and it's going to kind of you know, get thicker on the edges. Okay, so thin front, thicker on the edges. That's the kind of lens um, that'll help with myopia. Now on the other hand, some people are farsighted. They can see far, they just can't see things that are near to themselves. And this is because um, the eyeball is too short. Okay, it's kind of taller in taller rather than wider if you compare it to the um, normal shape of the eyeball. And so um, this will put the focal point behind the retina um, so that, you know, um, whatever farsighted people are seeing is blurry because that focal point is past the retina rather than really right on the retina. Um, and so for these people, they're going to have to have lenses that are thicker in the middle Okay, and kind of thinner on the outside to help focus that light right on the retina lining rather than behind it. The last problem we're going to talk about is called an astigmatism. And we get blurred vision caused by a misshapen lens or cornea. Okay, so either the lens or the cornea is misshapen. And so um, instead of having one focal point, of light, we get multiple focal points of light. Okay, like we see there. And so if we have multiple focal points of light on the retina, it just doesn't work. Okay, so um, that's why the, um, these people also have blurry vision. And, you know, this, like others, um, can be corrected with uh, lenses or contact lenses that uh, basically just kind of account for, smooth out that misshapen. Um, cornea or it's you know there's or lens um, in order to get a single focal point on the retina so that the um, vision is restored. All right so that's going to conclude our lecture on the nervous system and senses. Um, there is more to that chapter um, so make sure you go over and read that chapter but I uh, basically took care of kind of the more complicated parts of it in this lecture.